Good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Carlson, and I'm a ranger here at Big Cypress National Preserve. And uh, like Lou mentioned, I've uh, been a ranger for six seasons, working at a variety of different national parks. And uh, we'll explore that in just a little bit. Um, but really brief, I just want to mention um, the reason why I'm a ranger is because I enjoy not only visiting the national parks, but also visiting the variety of stories, the different cultures, and seeing the different landscapes that all of these parks have to offer. And, and in my travels and in my time as a ranger, I've been uncovering these stories. Um, and so today's presentation is going to be taking a look at some of the stories that we find here at Big Cypress, particularly those that we find underground. Um, I'm also the night sky coordinator for Big Cypress, and uh, we, meaning I host the night sky programs. We've done virtual, now we're back to doing in-person programming, and we've been focusing on the stories that we see up in the sky in the constellations. And like I mentioned, we're now going to take a look at the stories that we find hidden below Big Cypress and the swamp that we have out here. Well, before we get into those stories, I just want to talk briefly about me. Um, like I said, I'm originally from Wisconsin, and the last park that I worked at over this past summer was the Grand Canyon National Park. And I've had the experience of both working on top of the Grand Canyon as well as hiking down to the very bottom. It's about a mile of elevation change from the very top to the very bottom. Uh, going down to some of the oldest rocks that we have here exposed on Earth's surface, about 1.8 billion years old, located right in front of us here along the river corridor. I've also found myself uh, working at this national park um, this national park actually protects the oldest rocks in the National Park Service. Uh, these rocks are estimated to be 2.7 billion years old. And the picture on the left um, was taken, if we look at on the picture on the right, it was taken all the way up here. And this national park is no other than the Grand Teton National Park, where I've spent two seasons. And Grand Teton National Park, despite it protecting some of the oldest rock in the National Park Service, the mountain range is actually relatively young. So the rock is 2.7 billion years old and was formed underground, but only within the last 12 million years has it actually been pushing up. And in the grand scheme of geology and plate tectonics, 12 million years isn't a lot of time. I've also found myself working at Rocky Mountain National Park. Now these mountains are sort of the older brothers to the Tetons. The geology here is much older. The mountains are much more rounded um, and worn down due to erosion due to being formed uh, much longer ago. And so from going canyons below to mountains up top, hiking elevations upwards of 13,000 feet, I now find myself here in flat Florida, working at Big Cypress National Preserve as a seasonal ranger. Now what I lost, quote unquote, lost in the scenic beauty of the mountains and canyons, I've uh, made up for it in the amount of biodiversity and the intricacies of all the different plants and animals living together in this habitat. And that's what is super beautiful for me and, and rewarding for me as well. And you know, it's one of the reasons why I like being a ranger is that I get to go to these super cool places. But Florida, as we know, is mostly flat. And if you're going to look at a topography map, meaning a map showing elevation changes in Florida, the map would probably look something like this, where it's all just one uh, elevation contour color where it doesn't really show much up and down, doesn't show many hills. But in reality, Florida is a little bit more diverse than that. So this map here shows that Florida does have its ups and downs. The highest point in Florida, some of us may know, is um, it's called Britain Hill. It's 340 feet above sea level, and it's actually the lowest high point of any state. And it's located all the way up here in the Florida Panhandle. So even though Florida does have its ups and downs, it's primarily lowland, flatland areas. If we zoom in closer to Big Cypress, this is what our topography looks like, where we're right on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, 
And so most of our, our land here in Big Cyprus is relatively flat, low elevation. I think the highest point in Big Cyprus is something like 18 feet. And it's because of this low elevation that it, that's what generates our, our habitats, primarily our swamps. So Big Cypress National Preserve is predominantly swamp. Over um, During our wet season, 90% uh, of the land is covered with water. And so water is a very big and a very important resource to us. So because of all this water, we have all of these different types of plants that enjoy this wetter habitat. Uh, our swamp lilies, for example, or the um, super intricate and weirdly shaped strap fern, which we see on the right side. Um, but all these different things, all these different stories that we find on the surface wouldn't be the way they were if it wasn't for what we find below the surface here at Big Cypress. And so today we're gonna take a look at a, several different stories of what we find, and we're gonna put these stories into different genres of books. And we're going to put these genres of books onto our library shelf that we see in front of us here. And so some of the books that we are going to take a look at today, we will be reading a travel blog, taking a look at an autobiography, take a look at a couple of romance novels, my favorite, and then delving into culinary, which actually is my favorite. Because after you're done reading a culinary uh, recipe or review, typically you've got some, a little reward for yourself. You've got something to eat. So the very first thing that we're going to take a look at today, our very, very first genre, is going to be our travel blogs. And so congratulations, you have won The Price is Right. And so part of your winnings uh, today is you get an all expense, all expense paid trip to one of the following locations. So your first option is a all expense paid trip to French Guiana in South America. Enjoy the diverse wildlife that we see, the colorful macaws, parrots, and other birds of paradise. Take in the wonderful um, Caribbean islands, Caribbean shores, and the blue tropical blue waters. Otherwise, I mean, there's waterfalls there. I don't recommend that you stand that close to the edge of a waterfall, but nonetheless, um, spectacular sights to be seen in French Guiana. Our next option is the arid west coast of Africa. So taking in the cute and cute uh, colonial uh, western coastal towns and cities, otherwise explore the vast bazaars, the mighty deserts, or even the unique oceanfront landscapes that we see there as well. Or our last option is to just stay here in wonderful sunny Florida, enjoy our own Caribbean and tropical like beaches, uh, take in the diverse amount of, of wildlife, and then there's also that place near Orlando that we can visit as well. So all of these are all expenses paid and there's no need to, to comment in the chat, but just uh, where you're sitting now at home, decide where would you want to go to? Would it be to French Guiana? Would it be to West Africa? Or would you just like to stay home here in Florida and tour around some of the, the local areas? Well, what if I told you that once upon a time, all of this could be accomplished with just one plane ticket. However, this once upon a time would have to take you back millions and hundreds of millions of years ago to an earth looked like this. So this is about 500 million years ago. We can see Florida outlined here. And just to the left of Florida is the South, is South America, South American plate and the closest country being French Guiana. And then to the west, we have the continent of Africa. However, 500 million years ago, South America and Africa were not known. This, these plates combined into one, excuse me, was known as the supercontinent of Gondwana. Now, it sounds wonderful that, yes, we can take one plane ticket and go to the, all of these locations at once. However, this dot simplifies the South Pole. So no one really wants to travel to the South Pole, given the current weather conditions down there. 
I think we're happy right now looking at about a high of 80 degrees here in South Florida. So I think we'll be just fine sticking to Florida for today. But this is a story that started 500 million years ago. And as time progresses, we generally start to see Florida moving away from the South Pole, which is pictured here at the bottom of, the, of our screen. And as time progresses, we'll start to see the travel that Florida makes. So not only are we talking about our own travels to these different places, but we're now gonna take a look at Florida's travels throughout the last 500 million years. And so we're gonna jump ahead just a little bit. So this is 480 million years ago. And as we start to see plate tectonics move, all of these plates are essentially floating on Earth's surface, uh, known as plate tectonics. And these plates are ever so and always moving around, which is what accounts for our uh, earthquakes. And so once again, here is the South Pole. And right now here is Florida. So it hasn't moved much over the last 50 million years. But nonetheless, it is starting to genuinely, gen, generally transition northward. So as we continue to move forward, in the center of our screen now, the continent that just formed was known as the continent of Laurasia. And right around this time, the supercontinents of Laurasia and Gondwanda collided. And when these two plates collide and a couple others, they form the supercontinent Pangaea. So now we see that Florida, pictured here, is now at least touching the same continent as North America. However, it is still over the next millions, tens of millions of years, is going to shift from where it first collided into where we find it today. So once again, all of these plates still converging, still pushing into each other. Pangaea is still in the making here. And 340 million years ago, this is where we fly, find Florida now. It's also around this time, if you keep an eye on this circled area, that we start to see the major events that formed our Appalachian Mountains. And once upon a time, these Appalachian Mountains grew so tall, they were as tall as Mount Everest. But because they are so old and they were formed, hundreds of millions of years ago, they eventually eroded down into the nice rolling smoky mountains that we have today. So keep an eye on that area as we transition to our next um, transition event. We start seeing those Appalachian Mountains rising as well as Florida gradually moving closer to where it's found on the U.S. today. So the white simplifies high, high mountain ranges, the green simplify lower areas, and of course that blue, that light blue is going to be shallow inland ocean. So here we see Florida, for the most part, fused to the United States and the lower in our continent and where we find it today. And then snapshot 200, and, 200 million years ago, this is where we find Florida, right in line with the rest of our states. It's found its permanent home. And now that it's returned home, it's the end of our travel blog session. And so we're gonna jump back to our library here. And we're gonna take a look now at an autobiography. And as we know, autobiographies are a biography uh, written by the author itself. And we're, so we're gonna take a look at Earth as the author and the autobiography that it wrote here in South Florida. Keeping in mind, I have to set up the history of South Florida before I can set up the history of Big Cypress. So don't worry, we'll still talk about the National Preserve, but I just have to give us a little bit of a background. So let's take a look at our autobiography book. Oh, I must have pulled the wrong book off the shelf. This looks like a book about the Grand Canyon, one of the national parks that I've worked at. However, when we talk about the Grand Canyon, oftentimes we always talk about different stories represented in the different layers of rock. So taking a look out at the Grand Canyon, each of these different layers represents a different time in Earth's history. And so it's essentially like an open book. And there's a quote that I would like to share, that the Grand Canyon is carved deep by the master's hand. It is a gulf of silence, widened in the desert. It is the time inscribed on naked rock. It is the book of the earth. And this was written by Daniel, Donald Petty. 
And it's because of these layers exposed to, to the Earth's surface that we, we get this idea of an open book. This is another national park that sort of has the same concept, these different layers representing different stories, different times in Earth's past. And this is Bryce Canyon National Park, also located out in the American Southwest. And then once, back, once again, bringing it back here to South Florida, not a whole lot on display as, long, as far as geology goes. However, if we were to take a look at what we find below the surface, this is what we would find. So I'm going to essentially play a little time reel. And as this time reel moves up, we are moving backwards in time. And so each box that's gonna flash up on our screen is going to represent a different rock layer. So keep that in mind as well. Each box is a different rock layer. And as we move down this time scale, we are moving further back in time. So we'll begin it now. So each of those boxes that just scrolled up on our screen is a different type of sedimentary rock. And sedimentary rocks are basically rocks that have tiny particles that eventually get glued together and form um, a solid rock. So primarily here in, in, uh, in South Florida, we have different sedimentary rocks, mostly different types of limestone. And so each of these boxes represent, represents limestone forming under different conditions. It also represents roughly two to three miles of sedimentary rock, meaning that two to, if we were to take a cake knife and cut to the very, very bottom of Florida and pulled up that, pulled up that slice of cake, it would be two to three miles deep, which essentially it is saying that you're stacking two or three Grand Canyons on top of, on top of each other. And that's the type of geology, that's the story and the, the intricacy of the story that we have here in South Florida. And so arguably, you could say that South Florida has a more interesting geology than the Grand Canyon. Just make sure you say that here and not at the Grand Canyon because they might give you a, a stern look when you say that. And so 200 million years ago, where we, we find some of the oldest rock here in Florida, uh, right at the base, the very bottom, the basement, uh, we expect it to look at an environment very similar to this, uh, swampy, maybe not too far different from the swamps we see today, or maybe even seeing the not so distant ancestor of our alligator and crocodiles roaming the earth. However, 200 million years ago, the scene looked like this. It was explosive, it was volcanic, there was a lot of rifting going on, volcanic rifting. And so 200 million years ago, these plates started to shift again, started to move away from each other and created these rift valleys that looked like this with lava spewing out of the ground and covering the landscape. So this is once again, the scene 200 million years ago, the red line represents a rift zone, meaning that continents are moving away from this rift zone, creating a rift valley. And as time progresses, so this is 170 million years ago, uh, the plates are starting to move away from each other. And as these rift valleys form and spew this lava on the surface, this is what gives Florida its basement rocks. We call it a basalt, the type of rock that form, and it's a volcanic rock that forms on the surface. So this lava spilled out on the surface, and then eventually as time went on, started to sink as the plate shifted, moving Florida underwater to move us into our next stage of uh, geologic formations in Florida. As the plates moved, Florida gradually started to move underwater. And so we start getting the shallow inland sea and all the critters and all the different uh, wildlife that live in the shallow inland sea. Uh, and primarily um, the types of animals that lived here um, lived in shells, whether they be like cephalopods or nautiloids, those curly shells that we see here, 
or these straighter shells, animals, but also like bivalves, clams, oysters, mussels, um, snails, things like that lived and thrived in these shallow inland seas. And so this is the scene 140 million years ago, Florida's underwater, and we start to see carbonates form. So a carbonate is a, just a fancy word for um, a, a limestone, essentially. Uh, we start seeing this carbonate factory where all of these different sea critters that live in these shells, they live in the shallow inland sea, they eventually die in the shallow inland sea, their shells are left behind, and through the process of wave action, these shells are ground down into tiny particles, it's dissolved into the water, and eventually as these keep layering on top of each other, they get cemented together and eventually form a solid rock. And so this is the scene 145 million years ago. If we look at the top of our screen, we see the Suwannee Channel. Now the Suwannee Channel is, is very important when it comes to the geology of Florida because the Suwannee Channel, this current that's right now hugging the east coast of, of the United States is pushing away any of these siliclastics, which is basically kind of the same sand. It's pushing these sand particles as well as these other particulates like clay away from Florida, which is why we have such a rich limestone environment and why we don't have layers of limestone, layers of shale, layers of sandstone. It's because the Suwannee Channel kept pushing away all of these particles out back into the Atlantic Ocean, leaving this rich carbonate factory environment to form this, this uh, pure limestone. And so this is what the scene would have looked like from above, very similar to what we see down in the Keys, the Bahamas area, the shallow, um, the shallow sea. However, this is what it would look like below the surface. Um, once again, we have a lot of different uh, sea creatures living, but we also have a variety of corals. Corals also using calcium um, as part of their structures. And once they die, uh, also becoming part of the limestone once they get ground up. Now flash forward to 34 million years ago, we start seeing sea levels rise, sea levels fall due to the amount of glaciation or the amount of glaciers that are forming on the North and South Poles. So less glaciers, more water, higher seas, more glaciers, less water, lower seas. And so we start to see the sea level falling. And now we start to see dry land start to emerge. Our Suwannee Channel has been reduced to the Gulf Trough because now it's moving between the coast of North America as well as this new um, land that's forming in the middle of Florida. So now the water is moving in between these two waterways and we call it a trough now. It's still preventing any of the sands and clays coming off of the, the, the main continental US from settling in onto Florida, which is why we still, during this time, have a very rich limestone um, being created. But 23 million years ago, enough sediment has filled in that gulf, tr gulf trough to start connecting Florida to the mainland US. And so now is where we start to see the introduction of quartz rich sands, as well as clays. And so during this um, rock, formation, rock forming time, is where we start to see a lot of um, sandstones as well as shales and mudstones being deposited. And as early as 2.6 million years ago is where we start to see Florida uh, continuing to grow. There are still towards the south, we see here these shoals, once again, just sort of like a shallow oyster bed. These oud bars, basically just the type of limestone as well as these coral, coral reefs still continuing to be located underwater, still forming limestone. Um, 125,000 years ago, this is what the shoreline would have looked. Once again, we're looking at not a lot of glaciers, a very high sea, but as early as 20,000 years ago, this is where the, the coast of Florida used to be when we had a lot of glaciers um, sucking up all the water, creating a low sea. So this used to be the old Florida coastline, but now this is what we find in the present day, where we're currently um, at, with an area view, aerial view over Florida. And this is where Big Cypress is located, here in southwest Florida. 
So now we're going to take a look at some of the rocks in specific that we find here in Big Cypress. So we sort of set the stage for how rock formed here in South Florida, and now we're going to dive in deeper as to the rocks that we find in particular underneath the soil here in Big Cypress. And so the main rock type that we find is the Tamiami limestone. We also have Miami limestone and the Shelley sediment plyo Pleistocene age. Um, limestone as well. And plyopleistocene is just, a, a, just an age that we give the rock. It's basically saying this rock was formed this many millions of years ago. So that's all plyopleistocene really means. And then Holocene is just the most recent. It's not had enough time to actually form a rock. It's still a loose sediment. And so if we take a look at the age of these, um, these rocks, Tamiami limestone ranges from 13 million to 2.6 million years old. Those shelly sediments of the Pleistocene age, 2.6 to 10,000 years ago, and the Miami limestone forming as early as 100,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And those Holocene sediments forming within the last 11, or being deposited within the last 11,000 years. And because this limestone is so young, means that it hasn't had a lot of weathering. And the shells that formed it were very much intact while it was formed. And so some of the limestone that we find here in Big Cypress is some of the most fossil rich and fossil diverse in the entire world um, because we have such a young limestone here. In fact, the geology of Florida is the second youngest geology in all of the US. Hawaii has a younger geology just due to their uh, volcanic activity and uh, that formed the islands there. But Florida, because it was underwater as, as um, early as the last 10,000 years, 20,000 years, it uh, has the second youngest geology. And this is why all these different fossils are evident here in Big Cypress, a picture that I took here of, of a clamshell. Um, there's, you, can't, you can hardly not pick up a rock here in Big Cypress and not find evidence of this shallow inland sea, as well as the fossil history that we have here. It's, it's um, it's super rich, super diverse, and it's very apparent here. And so these different stories that we read, these different geologic um, periods that we discussed, all are stories that we find hidden below the preserve and uh, gradually make their way to the surface. Moving back to our uh, library bookshelf here, we're gonna take a look at uh, our dreaded romance novels. Uh, and in order to do this, I actually have two novels, uh, two books that I'm just going to read the, the summaries of. And so our first um, novel, art was done by a sixth grader that we had uh, that visited our preserve. The uh, summary of the book goes like this. Pete is a rich and generous soul, but a horrible accident left him scarred and broken. He was afraid to give his gifts to charities in fear that his appearance would tarnish the organization's appearance and reputation. He fell into a depressive state and turned to the shut-in life, that is, until he met Kai. Pete furnished all sorts of gifts to Kai, helping her grow, and in turn, she multiplied these gifts to help others. Pete's generosity lived through Kai, and Kai gave back to Pete through the gifts of love and companionship. And so these characters, Pete and Kai, we both find uh, here in Big Cypress. So this is Kai, or Cypress, actually. So it's Cy, not Kai. So this is our character, Cypress. And this is our character, Pete. Oh, Pete. Oh, Pete is a generous soil, not a generous soul. And so this is a, a relationship that we see here in Big Cypress between one of the soils that we have, our predominant peat soil, and our cypress trees, which is um, what we're known for at Big Cypress is our cypress trees. And so this peat soil is a very nutrient-rich, a very um, organic soil. It has a lot of nutrients and provides uh, a lot of nutrition for plants to grow as well as our cypress trees to grow and not only grow but to grow big and robust and strong. So that's how the soil helps the tree 
But because our cypress trees are actually deciduous, meaning in the fall, they will lose their needles and then regrow them back for spring, these nutrients that are kept in these needles when they fall get digested and get decomposed into the soil and help to maintain this nutrient cycle being absorbed by the tree and then being reintroduced by the tree. And so not only uh, does the soil, does the tree give back to the soil, so Kai giving back gifts of love and companionship to P, they also give and multiply their gifts to all these other different plants and organisms that we find here at Pig Cypress, our red-bellied woodpecker, our variety of epiphytes and air plants and mosses and lichens, um, and all the other wildlife that use these plants for survival. So these are the gifts that are multiplied through Kai or through our cypress trees uh, that help to benefit um, the, the variety of other organisms that we have here in Big Cypress. So now our next novel, once again, art done by a sixth grader. Our next novel reads like this. Bottom of the barrel, scraps and poverty. These words all too familiar to Carl, a poor field worker. Though lacking material and monetary wealth, he's a kind and generous soul. He gives freely to rich and poor. There is no discrimination in his mind. Some that he gives to try to help him in return. Others become almost parasitic, depending on his little gifts, and continue to drain him, drain him of these meager resources. Carl is stuck in this seamlessly endless struggle. So once again, we find the characters present here in Big Cypress. This is Carl. Carl. Actually, it's moral. This is our moral soil that makes up our fresh moral prairies. And this is the prairies that the soil supports. And so because the soil, moral soil, is a very nutrient-poor soil, it can't contribute to the growth of, these, of, a, of a diverse plants or to the, the large um, trees that we find here in the park. And so that's why our moral prairies are, are dominated by these grasses and these smaller plants but they're also dominated by these types of trees as well. So these are cypress trees. However, because they grow in this nutrient-poor soil, they don't grow to be as big or as robust as our other cypress do in the cypress swamps. And so because their growth is stunted, we refer to them as dwarf cypress or pond cypress. Now, in the grand scheme of things in nature, the deer, the red-bellied woodpecker, the potbelly air plant doesn't care what we call these what we call these trees. All they care about is that the tree is there and that it's uh, functioning in the ecosystem as it's supposed to. So we can call it one thing or the other, but at the end of the day, it's a cypress tree fulfilling its function. All right, so that actually uh, concludes our romance section. The final uh, story we're going to take a look at here today is, like I said, my favorite, our culinary uh, food blog. And we have prepared for us today a, uh, a recipe called the Sunnyland Crude Brulee, a recipe refined over the years. And so the equipment that we will need to prepare our crude brulee, we'll need a pressure cooker and a 20 by 150 mile mile ramekin dish, which is pictured here. Ingredients, you'll need 2 million tons of miscellaneous sea creatures, about 4 trillion cups of phytoplankton, a few billion dashes of blue-green algae, and you can substitute uh, with green algae for fewer calories. You'll need millions of acres of hard, impermeable rock split into two equal parts, and salt to taste. Now directions, using half of your impermeable rock, coat the bottom uh, bottom of the ramekin dish. You can combine the rest of your ingredients together and spread it over this rock layer. Now keeping in mind thickness doesn't matter, it'll all cook through. And then sprinkle the rest of that, in the second half of that impermeable, impermeable rock over the dish. You will place the ramekin dish into your pressure cooker, set the pressure cooker to a temperature of 150 degrees, 115 degrees, and bury it two miles underground, and then let it cook for one 
100 to 120 million years or until the center is black and caramelized. Now to serve this dish, you're gonna need not necessarily a spoon, but one of these. So the recipe that we just looked at was essentially the recipe for the creation of crude oil. And what we're taking a look at here on our screen is actually an oil pump. And this is one of the oil pumps that we have inside the preserve. So because we are a national preserve, we allow a variety of different activities to take place, including off-road vehicle use, uh, such as swamp buggies and airboats, private land ownership, um, hunting, and mineral exploration as well. And so that's why we do find um, oil pumps inside the National Preserve. Taking a look at this picture here, we can see big cypress in green. The red box, that's that, 200, that's that 20 by 150 mile um, ramekin dish. Essentially the, 200, the 20 by 150 mile, that red box there, um, is where is an oil trend or oil play is what they call it. And that's where there's um, pockets of oil, reservoirs of oil hidden below the um, Earth's surface. And uh, we see that it runs through the east corner of Big Cypress National Preserve. This is what the oil operation looks like up there. These are some of the filtering tapes that filter water from the oil. And it's always weird talking about oil extraction working for the National Park Service, because ultimately this is what we want to protect, right? We want to protect the natural and scenic landscapes for the enjoyment, inspiration, and education of this and future generations. But what's deceiving about this picture here is this is actually an old oil site. This is an old oil well right here. And because these activities take place inside the National Preserve. They are heavily regulated, they are heav heavily monitored, they are heavily permitted. And uh, we ensure that these activities don't degrade the landscape. It's written, to, written into contracts and agreements with these, these oil entities that they have to make sure that they care for the landscape the same way that we want to care for the landscape. And so once they, uh, once they um, are done drilling at a site, it's written into the contract that they help to have to help to promote um, the landscape to return to its natural setting, which is what we see in front of us here. Now see, all of these stories that we talked about are stories of the past, of the past hundreds to even tens of millions of, and even hundreds of millions of years ago. But only within the last couple of decades was a, a, different, was a, a different story almost written. So Big Cypress National Preserve was established in 1974 to help protect the Big Cypress Swamp and the watershed that we have here. And all of this was under threat once upon a time. And we're going to take a look at these different threats and these different stories that were almost written here. In fact, some of them even were written. Agriculture, farming. We had extensive farming operations that took place in the eastern portion of the park. In fact, most of the canals that we have dredged here were uh, created to um, drain the water, drain the wetlands to allow dry land for farming. And so this was a story that was written. Another story that was written was cattle grazing. We had going on to the northern portion of the preserve. Now cattle grazing, not only does it produce enough of uh, fecal waste and um, other material into the environment, but the act of grazing compresses the soil and makes it very hard and impenetrable. Big Cypress is a recharge zone for our local aquifers. So aquifers are those large underground groundwater storage tanks that uh, where we get our drinking water from. And if these cattle were allowed to uh, graze on the land, they would compress the soil to where water couldn't infiltrate the soil and uh, we wouldn't be able to recharge the aquifers. And, in South Florida and the Naples area, and even uh, we rely on this, these aquifers for our drinking water. And so this was another story that was being written. And of course, the infamous jet port proposed in the late 60s was to be the largest jet port in the entire world and really uh, threatened the movement of water um, in Big Cypress. Um, our swamp, it's not the typical stinky, smelly, stagnant water swamp. It's a swamp of moving and flowing water and this moving flowing water helps to provide a fresh water for our marine estuaries that are so important to our sea life here. Now pictured here, this is Denver International Airport, which is the world's second largest airport. 
So we just, just imagine essentially this, this whole operation right here in our preserve. And with the development of an airport comes the development of infrastructure, roads and highways. We have hotels that would spawn up. No one wants to spend a night at a airport. So you would have the hotels and the hospitality business moving in. And with that, everyone needs a place to live. And so continued housing developments would have also sprung up in this area as well. So these were the stories, some of them were written, some of them were endangered of being written. And essentially we were gonna have a story of a huge metropolis located right here in Cypress Swamp. But this story changed when two authors got a hold of, of the book, Marjorie Stillman Douglas, and Nathaniel P. Reed. These were the new co-authors of Big Cypress. And what they decided to do is write a story of protection, prosperity, and future enjoyment. And so where they may have had the biggest signature on the book, they were also joined by a variety of other individuals and lobbied Congress to establish Big Cypress as a national preserve in 1974. So these co-authors included some of the Gladesmen, the outdoorsmen, the private landowners, the, the swamp buggy enthusiasts, they all came together to ensure that this area was protected not only for their enjoyment now, but for the enjoyment of future generations, which is the mission of the National Park Service. And so when you come to Big Cypress, what we hope for you is that you uh, take a look around and that you uh, learn and understand a little bit more about what's around, uh, what's around us. And keeping in mind that what we find around us wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for what we found below the surface of the National Preserve. And so what we invite you to do, come out and visit, hopefully because we're in your backyard, most of you have already seen us, but we want you to come here, write a story and create a memory. And then through that memory and through that story that you wrote, not only do you continue to help to write the, the success story of Big Cypress and the continual protection and preservation, but you also help uh, to, to write a story to attach a meaning to this place. And so we invite you to come out, visit the, the, visit the National Preserve, write a story, and then you know, realize why it's important for that story to be continued on. And if you've already been to Big Cypress, maybe visit a, a different park, someplace else in, in here in Southwest Florida, attach a story to it, and then figure out how you can help to protect that story in the landscape. And that is actually the conclusion of my uh, presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. And at this time, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, try to answer them. Well, to put it a little bit into perspective, so the, the jet port itself would have, would have only been a very small fragment of the overall preserved landscape. I would have to say only maybe five to 7% of the whole land area would have been dedicated solely to the jet port. Um, but like I, like I mentioned, it's not just that jet port that's going in, it's all the infrastructure. Um, a lot of the old buildings that we have here in Big Cypress are left over from the different um, developments that we had going on that were uh, connected to the uh, jet port, for example, my office building here is a, a renovated motel that was being built. The house that I live in is, uh, was from a housing development that was being developed um, in wake of all the tourism and all the housing that was gonna be needed for this jet port. Um, I would imagine that uh, all of Highway 41 through this area would just be um, comparable to any major interstate uh, with the McDonald's and the gas station. Um, so it's really, it's really hard to, and with all the farming and, and cattle enterprises that were going on, there are still a lot of scars on the landscape that you can see where farming took place. So if we didn't have a national preserve here, this, it's probably pretty easy to say that we will, all this, this, all this land that if you could dredge it, if you could dry it out, would have been developed. So you, know, you could probably say there would be no land left over after the, the installment of the national, of the jet port. Thank you everyone for uh, partaking in the program.